to everyone for starting about uh, 11 minutes late here. Um, so I am Lieutenant Colonel Brennan Toll, and I'm the commander of the Mid-Atlantic Army Recruiting Battalion. Uh, and as many of you know, uh, we're responsible for recruiting uh, for the Army, the United States Army Reserves, uh, from the five counties that make up the city of Philly uh, and then the entire state of New Jersey. Um, you know, we've all gotten used to this kind of uh, um, virtual world that we're all kind of living in. And so usually we would say welcome to today's kind of event. But I think we'll start by saying uh, thank you for welcoming us into your homes. I know that we've got uh, some special guests who are going to speak uh, on the line with us today. A lot of our recruiting force and our station commanders uh, are also listening in, and they've brought along some future soldiers uh, who have made the decision to serve in the Army but are waiting to ship out to basic training. And then we have a few uh, prospective candidates who are also going to listen in uh, today. So I want to welcome everyone, uh, and we're, you know, we're going to get started into the program here. I think I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say uh, just a few words about kind of what is, uh, is going on in the country. Um, you know, obviously the city of Philadelphia, uh, the city of Trenton, uh, and a few other areas that are, um, you know, are watching, um, you know, these, these protests go on all over our, all over our country. And, uh, you know, from the Army's point of view, uh, I'll just say that our, our heart aches for all of the communities um, that have been disenfranchised for so long. And I say that genuinely. Um, one of the best parts about being in the Army is that the Army's stated values, uh, and for the most part, the execution of those values um, is of equality in our ranks. And that's why I am so proud uh, to be a part of the Army and the people that I have served with, um, you know, all genders, all races, all orientations, uh, every different type of American out there uh, doing their duty for the nation. Um, and, you know, this battalion stands with uh, everyone who is having their voices heard. And I sincerely hope that there is uh, genuine change uh, in, in communities all over the country. And, you know, equality is what uh, ends up reigning supreme uh, for everyone in this country. And, you know, as a segue to the program, you know, I think that's why our recruiters are so passionate about trying to offer the opportunities and benefits of service in the United States Army and the Army Reserves, because we have seen um, you know, an Army that does value its people. Now, we're not perfect by any means, and we do need to continue to work towards uh, equality for everyone, uh, but we are proud of the organization and our stated values and our goals. So this webinar series is kind of uh, started, uh, you know, we had one so far, we're gonna do about a six uh, series webinar out to 4th of July. Uh, that really was designed to try to make up for the fact that due to COVID-19, we were not able to be in high schools, colleges were out of session, and there weren't a lot of areas to go uh, and get the Army's message out there and to recruit. And so the webinar series started. Uh, last week, we had Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, or former Sergeant Major of the Army Daily, on to talk about uh, the Army's opportunities and how we're dealing with COVID-19, uh, and that we're offering the same opportunities and benefits uh, that we always have. Now, this week is titled The Soldier Story which is we've brought uh, four individuals on, guest speakers, who are going to talk about their story uh, about the Army uh, and what they, you know, um, you know, what they have gotten out of it, their experiences. And we hope that this generates some discussion uh, and some questions uh, for those of you who are just wondering what basic training is going to be like or what a life in the Army has been like. I've been doing it personally for 21 years, and it's the best decision that I uh, ever made. And so that's what we're going to talk about uh, today. I would like to highlight that the Army is open and we are hiring, we're open for business. And like I said, we are offering the same opportunities and benefits, whether it be college money, um, you know, healthcare, medical, dental, all that, job credentialing, uh, soft skills, you know, all of those different things are still available in full uh, that we always have offered. And so we, 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 at a minimum, come out and talk to one of our recruiters uh, and get the full picture so you can make a decision about uh, your future. So I'd like to introduce our panelists today, uh, and I'm, I'm going in order of those that we're going to speak. We are so honored to have a uh, former staff sergeant, now uh, uh, Mrs. Erica Webster, who is a local veteran uh, and a business owner. She owns uh, Dub Fitness. Uh, I believe she is out in Montgomery County, which is uh, the northern county of, uh, of Philadelphia, and uh, she's going to be our, our main guest speaker. Also, though, with us today is uh, Specialist Eric Ruano. Uh, who was in my old unit, 3rd Battalion, 13th Field Artillery, uh, Red Dragons out at Fort Sill. He's a 25 Bravo information tech specialist. And like I said, he's stationed out of Fort Sill, and he's going to tell his story. He enlisted out of our Bloomfield station in New Jersey. With us is PFC Alvin Arias, a 68 Whiskey medic, 
who was stationed at Fort Carson and enlisted out of Union City, which is also in northern New Jersey. And then we have Cadet Lauren Lassen, who's a, uh, she was a originally enlisted in the Army uh, Reserves. She received a Minuteman scholarship, so she's on a path to be a reserve officer. And she's currently serving as a 42 Alpha Administrative Assistant uh, in the Horsham Air Guard. Uh, and she enlisted out of Doylestown in Bucks County. And so welcome to all of you. I, I thank you so much uh, for that. And I will turn it over to uh, Mrs. Erica Webster, who's going to start us off telling her Army story. Thank you, sir. And thank you for this opportunity. I'm going to hopefully be able to share my screen without kicking myself off of here. Um, so good morning. I'm just going to basically story tell. I really uh, think that I have a funny story of how I joined the military. And um, it's something that I like to share personally, especially if there are parents watching um, with their kids. Uh, but first, my name is Erica Webster. I joined the Army right out of high school, actually when I was 17. And um, it was something that I just knew that I needed to do. I come from a military background. Most of my family are West Pointers. Uh, and I was the first actually enlisted. And when I joined, or when I decided that I was going to join, my mom decided that I wasn't going to join. And she fought me tooth and nail to the point where she actually called the police on my recruiter. And because I was 17 and underage and um, she just didn't understand how the system worked. And so I just, I can never forget actually sitting in the recruiter's office and my mom is all of five foot, 120 pounds soaking wet with her arms crossed being escorted by two police officers to come take me home from the recruiting station. And it was this whole mess. But um, since then, she has come to love the military. Actually, um, Ruano, my sister is stationed at Fort Sill. She is the PA um, and my brother-in-law is also there. So it's the military is still my family and it's still the core of my being. I haven't stopped serving just because I exited. As you can see, actually it's on this side, um, my logo still represents um, our colors and everything that I believe in. But um, the picture of 9-11 here that I shared is I was a sophomore in high school. Some of you may not have been born yet. Um, and this was kind of like the pivotal moment in my life. So in eighth grade, I knew I wanted to be in the Marine Corps. The Marine Corps is, uh, was actually my first goal. And so when 9-11 happened, I was 16, went right to the recruiting station. And they said, we can talk to you when you're 17, wait a whole other year. So while I was 16, the year from 16 to 17, I spent um, learning the general orders, doing PT, um, mastering the flex arm hang again, because I wanted to be a Marine. Um, so that's basically like, it was like that moment I knew um, and I became obsessed. So uh, a month later, my stepbrother was actually killed in a car accident and I started getting into some trouble, started to, you know, hang out with the wrong crowds. And I ended up getting a tattoo on the back of my neck, which then disqualified me for the Marine Corps at the time. So this was 2004 before waivers were given, before it kind of opened up. And when I went back to the Marine Corps station, they said that I was no longer eligible because the uniform collar did not cover my neck. And he told me to kick rocks and go visit the Army recruiting sta uh, station. So I did at the Plymouth Marine Law, went and joined the Army, which is the best decision that um, I ever made. So whenever you think that bad things are happening, it's I, I firmly believe that it's all for the greater good, for a, a higher purpose. And I'm very happy with the decision to join the military. Um, and then, so I joined, I was military police and went to basic training at Fort Leonard Wood. I was a part of what was called OSIT, one station unit training at the time. So from February to July, I was at Fort Leonard Wood. So I experienced the brutally cold winter and the stifling hot summers. And so for those who are not familiar, OSIT is basically the basic um, combat training part and your AIT put together. So there's no weekends, there's no passes, there was no um, freedom. It was basically drill sergeants in my face for the six months. So it was fun. Uh, but during that time period, I can still say, you know, I served eight years active duty that I think basic training was probably the greatest part of my career. It really taught me a lot about myself and what I was capable of accomplishing and how mind over matter um, is an actual, like it's literal. 
Um, as I said, you know, after my brother was killed, I kind of started acting out and I was a middle child. So I was already, um, you know, just always on the outside. And my mom would always say, you know, your sisters can all toe the line, but you always have to come leaping over it and barreling through everybody. And that was kind of my shtick. And uh, AC training kind of roped me back in and my drill sergeants taught me really quick that I needed to kind of self-reflect and reevaluate who I was going to be. And uh, to this day, so now I'm actually friends with one of my drill sergeants and he, uh, his voice would haunt me uh, for years after. And we actually connected on LinkedIn two years ago. And I was like, please don't yell at me. Your voice still scares me. But he um, told me that, you know, he had been following me and he was proud of me. And that was probably the greatest thing I could ever hear is from my drill sergeant tell me that he was proud of me uh, because this man really instilled some serious fear while simultaneously instilling some serious discipline. Um, so eight years um, active service. So the picture up there is me and my buddy Josh. And the reason why I picked that picture of he and I, because he recently um, took his own life. And that's part of the my mission, I guess, in life is working to um, help the whole the issue with um, veteran suicide. And he was my greatest friend. We were friends for probably six years. We deployed together. We were stationed together. And I have happy memories of him. And so he just kind of gave me more motivation um, to keep my mission going of, you know, fighting the fight for vets and getting us the help that we need. Um, but he, you know, is a part of basically my whole career. Um, the picture of me with the lasagna is whenever I was deployed and holidays would happen or birthdays, we would, um, so they do, we do it for my sister now, we put the picture so that you were having dinner with us. So there's me uh, for my sister's 21st birthday. Her favorite meal was lasagna. And it was, you know, that's kind of how my family coped with us being away. So I am one of four girls. I am the second from the oldest. And my sister who's right below me, she's the one that's still in. So now she gets to have lasagna dinners with her frame on the table. And then the picture below is me and Saddam Hussein's chair. And this is at Al Fal Palace, Palace in Baghdad. And what's significant about this is that I was the sixth cousin in my family to plop their behind on that chair. So um, my uncle has a picture of me and all my cousins in our different um, time frames sitting there. So it's kind of cool to say, you know, how big the world is, but yet we were all sitting there. Um, my sister went to Afghanistan, not Iraq, so she was unable to get that picture. Um, so as you can see, my first duty station at 18 was Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. And again, as an 18-year-old girl who was coming fresh out of basic training, fresh out of being a bad kid in high school, I was kind of stunned. It was 2005. And it was not so long after 9-11. So only thing I knew about Guantanamo Bay was that the masterminds of 9-11 were there. And it was the first time of you know me moving away from home and not having my parents or my siblings. And so again, another eye-opening experience. It's also where I experienced my first Article 15. So Article 15s, I think, are a rite of passage. Now, if you've never had one in your career, it doesn't make you a bad leader. However, I do say, you know, learning from experience kind of makes you a better leader. It makes you um, a leader with empathy because you were there, you can understand. And um, if I had known, again, then what I know now, I probably would not have done the things that I did. But again, it's always a learning curve. Uh, then after Guantanamo Bay, I went to Fort Leavenworth, which is the um, only maximum security prison in the United States military. And when I was being sent there, I was also confused as to why there were so many military prisoners because military, you know, we're supposed to uphold the standards. And same thing, you know, my mom was like, I don't get it. Why is there a prison? Aren't you guys all perfect? Um, so we, again, constantly learning. And then from uh, Leavenworth, I went to Korea. And at Korea, I actually had a really cool job of playing softball for the Army's team. So I was able to travel to Okinawa and um, all over Korea and other parts of Japan and represent uh, the United States military for softball. So that was kind of a cool break from my job for about six months. Um, and then another lesson to be learned, I was E5 promotable and we went out to celebrate my promotion and we broke curfew and then tried to hide it. and 
there comes my second article 15. So I went from E5 promotable to specialist. And that was the pivotal moment in my career. It was dead center. And I kind of had this like chip on my shoulder up until then because I was winning soldier of the year, soldier of the quarter, I was traveling. And so I needed to be knocked down a peg or two um, to kind of get myself back on track. And so I, I took the last four months in Korea to kind of buckle down. I started enrolling in college, taking advantage of all of the free um, education that the army offered that I was kind of passing up. And I did a complete 180. So I come back from Korea and nine months later, we came down on orders to go to Iraq. And then we also um, set up a different detainee camp in Al-Assad. So it was like constantly all over the place. And I, I loved it. I wouldn't change anything for the world, but we, um, <clears throat> I'm very close with my family, as I said. And one night in the middle of the night, we had access to a phone and I was able to call home. And it turns out that my sister had been in the hospital for two months um, while pregnant with my nephew. And she had to have him. He, was about three and a half pounds born. And kind of in that moment is when I realized that I wanted to be home, that I was tired of missing things. So I made the decision that I was not going to re-enlist. And that was a really tough decision for me because here I have my army family and over here I have my, my actual blood family. And I felt whatever decision I was making, I was going to disappoint someone or, or leave someone um, or let someone down. And I, you know, eventually made, obviously made the decision to exit, but I never was able to kind of get back that feeling that I had as a, like, as a serving person on active duty. Um, the, the purpose is a little bit different and I just really couldn't find my way. So then I, um, you know, ended up going to college after living in my mom's attic, working at a bar for a little bit, it took me a little bit of time to kind of find my my way. I was angry at all of the civilians. I hated civilians. I hated students. No one understood me. You know, no one walked downtown Baghdad. So how could they possibly understand anything? And this is when I found the student veterans group at Westchester University, and they kind of saved me. So I ended up becoming the first female president of the student veterans group, because as I do everything, I just kind of threw myself into it. And that became my life. And that gave me a little bit of purpose again. It started filling in the gap that I was missing from the military. So I started making changes, trying to get the faculty to understand the veteran students that we weren't plagued, that we weren't just all crazy, um, sitting in the back corner with our old PT caps pulled down really low. I was just really trying to bridge the gap. And then that's where I, I got involved in a lot of, um, you know, getting people to understand the military and, uh, connecting even like my recruiting friends to coming out and connecting with the ROTC and doing PT. And little by little, I just was, you know, my normal self being loud and making noise, but it was for the right reasons instead of the wrong reasons. So now um, I was the president of the student veterans group. I joined an organization called the Greater Philadelphia Veterans Network, and I was volunteering with them. And I, I now sit on that board. Uh, I became a part of a group called Team Foster, and we actually give service dogs to local veterans. And then I did what was called Miss Veteran America, and it was basically a Miss America pageant, but for women veterans. And our mission was to raise money for homeless female veterans. And it was really neat. It was a different kind of pageant. I mean, we wore the ball gowns and stuff, but we also had our combat boots on. And it was just kind of showing that, you know, you don't have to be this perfect image to represent something. And I was really lucky to be a part of that. And so from there, my, my speaking gigs and kind of doing things with the community just snowballed and it was pretty great. I loved seeing everyone and being around. And, and again, it made me have that sense of purpose that I felt I was missing in the military. So while this is all going on, PT is also really big. And if you are joining the military, if you're in the military, you know that that's probably the first thing that people ask you is what you score in your PT test or how many push-ups can you do? So a big thing for me in the military was always hitting the male standards so that no one could ever question my ability. So I would let my soldiers go first or let my, my uh, competitors go first. This way I only have to do one more than them. So I would never go first because I never knew how many I had to do, but if someone did 66, I would do 67, whether it killed me or not. Um, so then moving forward towards my, towards my business, uh, it kind of happened by accident. I hate saying that because it sounds pretty, pretty. I don't know, like just self-indulgent, like, oh, it happened by accident. But 
I think that without what I learned in the military and without joining the military, I don't know where I would have been. I had no interest in joining or going to college. I had no interest in anything. I just was kind of a lost soul. And the military gave me the love, the structure, the discipline, and the values to appreciate life. And so, you know, I, I, my thesis paper when I graduated college was on conscription. And I just kind of firmly believe that maybe someone should, should have to serve, whether it's 18 months in the Peace Corps or any type of military setting. But I think it's, it's an eye opener. And unless you've experienced it or witnessed it or been a part of it, it's something that's very hard to comprehend and to understand. Um, and so these are the things that I believe I've taken with me to be so successful outside of the military. And what I try to tell people and encourage them to join the military is resilience isn't something that you're just kind of born with. It's something that you kind of, you build. It's something that I learned through my Article 15s and thinking that my career was over or my life was over. Uh, leadership, bad leadership versus good leadership. And you'll hear it. I don't know if you have heard it before, but you you learn, or in my opinion, I think that you learn more from poor leadership than you will from positive leadership. Positive leadership is going to help you kind of move forward, but poor leadership is going to almost motivate you to not be that guy, to not do those things, to be better, to find out how to do something differently. Being authentic. I, again, leading off with telling you that I had Article 15s, that I wasn't perfect, and that my life wasn't always good, that's part of it. You know, wearing your flaws on your on the outer surface makes you more vulnerable, but also makes you more authentic and people will trust you. Grit, you know, just getting up there and, and doing it, things that you never thought possible, getting up on the pull-up bar or rolling through mud because your battle buddy, um, you know, forgot to put on her blank firing adapter or something crazy, some silly stories, things that are going to happen to you. Strength, um, you know, physical strength, of course, but mental strength. And that's one of the things too, when I wanted to quit or at 4 a.m. when we were waking up and it was freezing cold in Missouri, but just having that mental toughness and that strength to just keep going. And discipline, I mean, obviously that's a, that's a given. And then the training. So I take a lot of the training actually into my gym. So it's an all women's gym, but once in a while, I'll actually take them on runs for our run clinics and I'll call cadence and I'll do um, silly things that we did and make them laugh. But after running a mile, I'll say, hey, we just did a mile and you weren't even thinking about it because here I am calling crazy cadences, making you guys laugh and sing. Um, and then determination. So there's no, there's no quit. Right? You don't get to quit. So you either, you know, you build and you gather all of these things and you kind of like dig deep and you become this person that you never thought possible. And that's what I think the army or the military does for you. It shows you the you that you have deep down inside. And I don't think that there's anything else that can do that for you. There's no job, there's no place that can pull all of these things out of you and say, look, here's your potential, now go take it. Um, I think that's all that I think what I, everyone should experience. Um, so then here's an article, uh, so with Forbes magazine. So this is probably the greatest accomplishment, I think, of my post-Army life. It's being featured here and being able to kind of help veterans who are looking to start their own businesses and without getting into the details of running a company, but the fact that someone wanted my opinion, you know, this 16 year old girl who was a crazy maniac, whose mom called the cops on her recruiter, who didn't think about going to college, who barely graduated, but here I am now, you know, I graduated cum laude from, from Westchester University, the first female, you know, president, part of my own company. We won best of Philly, best of Monaco, and it's these things I don't think were, would have been possible um, without the military. Um, so I don't know if you recognize, this is your speaker, Sergeant Major or former Sergeant Major of the Army Daily. We, as a joke, invited him to come to Philadelphia. I think some of you may have actually been there. And, you know, he was the greatest Sergeant Major so, or of the Army when I was in. And when I heard he was coming to Philadelphia, I emailed uh, Mr. Wong and I was like, uh, can I like bring him water for his speech or something? I, I would love to come meet him. And so he was like, I'm going to do you one better. Let's see if he wants to come work out. So he came and it was incredible. It was probably one of, the, again, the coolest experiences of my life. Um, and he was a very, you can see he was a good sport about me giving him the strong NCO knife hand as when we finished. Uh, and he, again, like he is the epitome of leadership. 
And so when he became our Sergeant Major of the Army, I wanted to be like him and aspire to be like him. And so being able to meet him was kind of like meeting my celebrity, you know, it, for your favorite football player or your favorite actor or actress, he was mine. Um, and then the Military Police Regimental Association actually caught wind of it and they did an article and it was it was put in their magazine which was sent all over and so within the last year hearing from my former commanders my former sergeant majors who were reading this magazine and reaching out was again it's pretty cool and like i said like i don't think any of this would have been possible because the military teaches you how to follow and to lead and i think both of those make the whole person and then just to kind of um wrap it up here so my daily mantra is rise and dominate you know you can say rise and shine but why not rise and dominate, right? So take charge, take control of your destiny, of your destiny, whether it's one hour at a time, whether it's you know setting goals for the month out, maybe you're trying to get your PT um, score a little bit higher, maybe you want to join the military, but your ASVAB score is a little low, get out there and study, reach out to people, reach out at like, there's people, there's resources, there's so much thing, so many things out there uh, to help you do it. So there's no excuse for not getting things done. And you know, if, if you want to hear more about me, I'm happy to, you know, there's my contact information to share my story, to sit down with you, to invite you to my gym, to tell you how I really clawed my way up the mountain through the valleys and I'm still climbing. I'm still, you know, I still get setbacks. But if you wake up every day and you say, I'm going to rise and I'm going to dominate, then you can't, you can't be killed. So um, again, thank you for having me. Feel free to reach out. I am in Montgomery County. I am also all over Philadelphia uh, doing events. I host a 24 hour um, spin bike competition, which is in October. So if you have any interest in riding a bike for 24 hours, um, you can reach out to me. And again, um, thank you again for this opportunity. And I look forward to hearing what the panelists have to say. Let's see if I can. Hey, Erica, thank you so much for uh, for doing this for us. We really appreciate it. It's a wonderful story. I, I mean, I take a lot out of it. Obviously, we've got a few other panelists, but uh, the one byproduct is um, how, and you know, you've got to go through it to really recognize it. It's It's kind of hard for us as recruiters to tell them uh, to, to internalize something they haven't experienced, but the byproduct of the skills that you get in the military that you don't even know you're being taught just by just by doing what you're told and kind of going through those experiences and then taking them, and you know not everyone serves the full the full Monty uh, in the in the military and they take they go out and they're using these skills every day in their in their post military career and they don't even know it and you know your ability to capture that in your story. Uh, and, and hopefully pass this on to the, the young folks out there that are watching. We just really appreciate it. And uh, I, I, we'd love to come out there and do some, uh, we'll go out to Lansdale, to the Lansdale station. We'll go out and do some dub fitness and see if, uh, if I can keep up. I love it, sir. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. All right. We're going to go on to specialist Eric Ruano. Uh, Ruano, you out there? I'm right here, sir. Good morning. Right, man, I am ready to hear your story. Bloomfield Station and for everyone on there, this guy is in the greatest battalion in the United States Army, 3rd Battalion, 13th Field <laughs> Artillery, Red Dragons. All right. Red Dragons. Sir. All right. So my experience in the Army. So from the beginning, I, uh, I, I started college, and I realized it was a difficult thing to pay for. Um, you know, I was born and raised in northern New Jersey. I didn't really have much. Uh, then one day, just – randomly popped up in my head just why don't you just walk down to the recruiting station and I went there and took an ASVAB they said I can be a 25 Bravo and it's something I've always wanted to do especially in college working with technology um, I then get shipped off to Fort Benning Georgia to do my basic training and it was it was a wake-up call it was it was definitely just jumping into an ice-cold bath just your life as you knew it just changed and it, it taught me a lot of things it completely changed my life i was 20 years old never been out of home never been too far from new jersey and i just have these grown men just yelling in my face and i'm just i don't know what to do and they, it just taught me a lot of resiliency uh discipline and it just turned me into a better person um I then move on to Fort Gordon, Georgia to complete my AIT. And that just 
I mean, it completely changed my life. I, I don't even know how to put it into words. It's just, I went from being nowhere and having nothing to having a career, a future. Um, I then went over to Fort Sill to 313 Red Dragons and I get told a week after getting there, hey, we're going to Camp Casey in Korea in two weeks. So I guess you can see where my story goes, where it's just everywhere I went, it was just, I was just getting hit really hard. Like I didn't, just surprised. So then I go out to this environment as just a PV2 fresh, never been anywhere in my life. Um, it's definitely something scary. Um, you've never encountered anything like that before. Um, then I spent some time in Korea and that really built me as a soldier. Um, Erica did make a good point with her, um, you learn more from poor leadership than you would with good leadership. I had my leadership struggles and I learned a lot of things. I mean, even as a specialist, I still tend to lead my soldiers in a way where it was better than what I had before. And now that I have my positive leadership, it's just, I, they allow me to do that a little more than my prior leadership did. Um, and then we came back and I'm sitting here, I'm married now, I have a house. It's just something I couldn't imagine just being from North New Jersey and having nothing. So the Army's definitely changed me. It's made me a better person. Um, and that's my story. I'm still here living the dream. Well, Special Serrano, obviously I know you uh, from, you know, we were there together for all, you know, all nine months and some of the train up. I can't tell you how proud of, of you I am, man. I mean, you are, I'm just watching you grow up over the last two years. Uh, I'm just so proud. Of you. I didn't know, I didn't even know you got married recently. Right. That's, yeah. That is awesome. Congratulations. Thank you, sir. Um, can you real quick talk? So you're a 25 Bravo info tech specialist. What kind of systems do you work on? And, and not just in your job, maybe some of the stuff you worked on in Korea, just the, how, you know, the technical stuff. Okay. So, um, here in Fort Sill and in Korea, we had the same system, the CPN system. It's a, it's a bunch of boxes, really. That's, I guess that's the simplest way I can explain it. And it has your routers and switches. And basically what that allows is when I configure that and hook it up to my SCT, which is a big dish that speaks out to a satellite in space. When I set that up, it gives capabilities to everyone in the battalion to speak over uh, unclass. Uh, classify systems, uh, send fire missions, really, because without Camo, you can't do anything, really, in the field artillery world that I'm in. Um, we also had the Coven K, which was a, it was essentially the same thing. This was just a little bit different. The dish you actually had to put together yourself and move it yourself to get in contact with the satellite up in space. Um, and then I'm also right now currently working on ComSec, which is our, uh, it's basically our way of encrypting our communications right now. Yeah, it's just awesome because I know you want to talk. And I mean, we would get into a new position. I mean, I, you know, as a battalion commander, I got to talk to hire. I've got to maintain communications. And it's guys like Specialist Rano and his team who are setting up this incredibly complex and technical stuff. And they're just doing it like, like, it's, no, like it's no big deal. And they get this stuff to talk, you know, satellite, you know, encrypted, non-encrypted uh, communication. And it is critical. But, I mean, every Army soldier has a story where they're learning real skills that if he decided to, to transition out of the Army, uh, he's got. And so, Special Serrano, thank you for telling your story. Uh, good luck to you. I hope we stay in touch. And uh, Red Dragons. Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right. Tell everyone back there I said hi. I will. All right. Um, we're going to go out to PFC area. Is you out there? Yes, sir. All right, great. We're ready to hear your story. Uh, I'll try to keep it short. So, um, I've always wanted to join the military since I was a kid, but I was kind of hesitant to do it. So, I uh, didn't do it in high school, graduated high school, then 
my parents kind of wanted me to go to college for, I guess, since they never did. So I did that kind of to keep them happy, but I mean, I wasn't happy. I was kind of bored in college and uh, got my associates and then I didn't really want to do it anymore. So I just walked into a recruiting station and like uh, took one of those practice ASVABs and next week I took another, the real ASVAB. Um, I scored like pretty good on everything. So I had like every job available pretty much. And I didn't really know what I wanted, but I made a decision like the next day I picked um, actually EOD. And then I shipped out like a month later and uh, this was back in 2018. So graduated basic, went to Fort Lee. And then, so that training has like two phases. It's a long one and graduated phase one and I was there, then phase two in Florida, Eglin Air Force Base. So I was in that training for like eight months and then I failed out. <laughs> so they gave me combat medic. I was like, I had no choice, that's what they gave me. So that's what I am now. And I had like, the, I mean, I'm not interested in the medical field, honestly, <laughs> uh, but I had like the most fun in that AIT and like, uh, Miss Webster, I got an Article 15 there, but <laughs> so um, graduated that back in um, February. I went on hometown recruiting, so I got to go back before the whole coronavirus really kicked off. Um, so first duty station is where I am right now, Fort Carson, Colorado. I'm with the uh, Engineer Brigade. Uh, and since I got here, it's like, I got to experience it for a little bit, but then the whole coronavirus thing. So they had us working like in shifts kind of. So I'd come in like a couple times a week and they had limited hours on where we could work. But I've been learning a lot mm -hmm. since I got here and it's kind of back to normal now. So I've been working all week this week, but we're going to the field next week. So we've been doing preparations for that. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'm kind of excited to go to the field because I'm hoping to learn a lot there and meet my guys more since we haven't really been working together as much as I'd like to. But yeah. <laughs> hey, listen, uh, it's awesome. You like, in, you like Fort Carson? You like Colorado so far? I know you haven't seen everything because of COVID, but... Uh... Yes. Good? yes, sir. So far, I like it. I like the outdoors here. Lots to do. I uh, just oh, got yeah. a car a couple days ago, so I get to do whatever I want now. But there's there has been a curfew um, on post. Recently, they, they uplifted it, but now there's a curfew on Colorado Springs, so it's like... <laughs> We're going to get through it, and pretty soon yeah. you're going to be able to drive your car and go skiing or whatever uh, yes, out there in Colorado. But uh, be safe out in the field, all right? And uh, yes, I hope everything goes great out there, all right? Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. Uh, Cadet Lassen, you on there? Yes, sir. All right. You close us out, all right? Let us know your story. Okay. Um, my name is Lauren Lassen. I'm from Warrington, Pennsylvania. Um, I enlisted when I was 17 out of a uh, Doylestown recruiting station. Um, I listed my junior year in March. And then um, as a 42 Alpha, which is a human resources specialist. Um, so then I went to basic training this summer between my junior and senior year at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. And I was there for about three months and it was pretty scary, but um, it really like taught me a lot about um, self-discipline and time management and leadership. And it really like changed my perspective on things in general. Um, so then it was really weird going from like a basic training setting to high school again. So I went from like carrying a rifle all the time of the day back to like high school where like you can't have like any freedom or like just like stupid rules that don't apply to the military. So it was just kind of like culture shock in a way. 
Um, so I finished my senior year of high school, and while I was doing, while I was in my senior year, I worked with a recruiter, uh, Sergeant First Class Gilbreth at Duesam Recruiting, and um, we built a packet together to submit for a Minuteman Scholarship, which is, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of, like the ROTC program at colleges. So um, the Minuteman Scholarship is specific for reserve soldiers, so you would have to be enlisted first as a reservist and then to be able to qualify to, for the Minuteman. So um, we built the packet and it took a long time, so I had to do like your GPA, your SAT score, your letters of recommendation, your community service, your part-time job, pretty much everything about you in this packet determines if you are going to get the scholarship or not. So I joined the military because I wanted to serve my country and my older brother joined the Marines right out of high school and I was just so inspired by like his courage and bravery and I wanted to do kind of like the same thing but I wanted to go to college and I, my end goal is to become a doctor. So um, ROTC was like the perfect um, situation for me. So when I found out that I received the scholarship, I was like so happy. It was like the best feeling. Um, something I knew, something I wish I knew before going to basic training was um, to definitely be how to manage my time better. Um, it doesn't really seem that important, but if you wake up five minutes late in basic training and you're five minutes late to formation, it's a big deal. So. Um, that's something I definitely wish I knew. Similarly, if you need to clean your weapon and you push it off to the next day and then something comes up and you don't have time to do it, like your shooting's gonna be off. So it's just like little things like that. I think like I really wish I knew to prepare for. Um, so currently I'm at um, Horsham Air Guard Station, the 338 Medical Brigade. Um, I was really nervous going to my first duty station because I was like, just out of basic training and like, I don't know, I was just really nervous about it. And um, it was raining and we had a PT test and I was like, oh, my run time's gonna be off, but it ended up being fine. And I got to know a lot of people from my unit. So it was a pretty good experience. Um, so now I'm a cadet at LaSalle University and my host school is Drexel. And that basically consists of PT every day before classes. And you have to be a full-time student, which means you have to have toll credits or more, which is between five and six classes, depending on how many credits per class, um, which is a lot. It's basically like having a full-time job on top of being a student and then also having like another job if you like have time to do that or if you need to for financial reasons. So it's really, um, it's challenging, but I feel like the Army really shaped how I can manage my time and how I can um, like build myself up and be a better leader and hopefully open opportunities later in life. So that's my story. All right. So, uh, so uh, Lauren, you go to LaSalle, but you do ROTC at Drexel? Yes, sir. Awesome. All right. Well, listen, you know, and, and uh, Cadet Lassen is a great example that once you join the Army, right, you get through basic training, there are just so many ways that your career path could go, you know, and I think you heard uh, four or five, you know, four different uh, versions of that. But I mean, there's ways to become officers. There's a way to become warrant officers. You stay like uh, Miss Webster on the non-commissioned officer path. Uh, there's just a lot of ways to to uh, craft a career that you can be proud of, you know. And that doesn't even mean you can't switch jobs, you know, once you're in the army uh, to try to uh, transition into another career path if that's what you're interested in doing. So we appreciate you telling your story. Uh, and so I'm just going to answer one question that I know that got asked now. Uh, by our future soldiers uh, for everyone. And then uh, maybe we'll take one more question and we can close this out. So one of the future soldiers asked, how was basic training uh, being handled now in the COVID-19 environment? And so I'll just say that the Army did take a small break uh, from training uh, back in April to try to figure out how to do this as safe as we possibly can. And once we did that, they went back. And so now they're just uh, sticking to the social distancing. You know, they're wearing masks. There's a two-week quarantine when you get there uh, to ensure that everyone, uh, you know, is tested and ensure no one has it. Uh, and then they get, they get out to training and they're just doing it different. But the Army always figures out a way to continue to move forward. Uh, so there's really nothing to be worried about. Uh, and then again, 
because of where you're at, you know, if something should happen, you know, hospitals on every military facility, you know, you already talked, you know, Arius, he's a 68 Whiskey medic. Uh, you know, the medical uh, access to medical care is, is, uh, is wide and vast on military installations. So uh, we are, we're operating in the COVID-19 environment. We're just sure, uh, we're just trying to be sure. So um, Gio or Mike, do we have another question we might want to take? Here's a pretty good one, sir, for Erica. Um, if it came up, I think you could see them too, Erica. But what would you tell that 16 or 17-year-old girl yourself back then to reassure her that she was on the right path? Good question. Um, I think the biggest thing was knowing that I had a support system behind me and that I was incapable of failure. So no matter how hard things were or how bad I thought it was and I didn't think I could move forward, like I was stuck in mud, that I knew that I had an, an army behind me kind of pushing me forward. So I think it's really important to have a support group, you know, someone to write letters to you, send care packages. It's those little pieces of normalcy that kind of get you through. It's the five minute phone call that we would get on Sundays. Um, so I think just establishing your your core support group and leaning on them and trusting those people. And, you know, not everybody has a family. So lean on your recruiter or lean on someone um, that you meet in basic training, but there, there is someone. So I would just say, you know, don't do it alone. You don't have to be alone and you get the strength from other people. I hope that helps. Awesome. Great. Uh, sir, do we want to do another question or? Yeah. yeah. How about, how, yeah. How about one more? How about one more? Okay, there, this one just popped in. What advice or tip can you give to keep a strong mentality throughout basic training? And this could be for, for any of the panelists. Um, you're welcome to chime in and offer your insight there. Uh, Special well, is Ron, are you still uh, in there? Um, let's see. Well, the question was, how, what can you do to, like, the mindset to have for basic training to keep to it going? Keep, it, yeah. keep that strong mentality. Yep. Yep. So, um, let's see. For me, it was just living my day, breaking down by the different times we would eat. So it was like, okay, we got to go through this. Let me just make it to breakfast and I'll be okay. Then it'll be, let me make it to lunch and I'll be okay. And let me make it to dinner and then it's the next day. Uh, the, you really just, you want to let your mind be free and be able to be molded by your drill sergeants that are there. Because if you, if you keep trying to go against it, it's just, you're gonna, you're gonna want to quit. Um, and that's another thing you have to go through. You just have to sit there and just not think about quitting. Like just, just keep going. Don't think you just, your, your mind is going to give out way before your body does. And, if you just do what they tell you, everything will be fine. I think another thing too that I found myself doing was, so you'll, you'll have fire, fire guard or CQ, and it was looking for the, the normal, almost like idiosyncrasies of your drill sergeant that shows that they're a human, that they go home every night to a family, that they wear normal street clothes. And so, because you're in this environment where you just forget real life, so when you see them kind of be normal or chew a piece of gum that you haven't seen in months, it kind of reassures you that this is temporary, it is not forever, and that, you know, eventually you're, you're going to get through this and your drill sergeant is just a normal person like you who also went through it. So I think kind of reassuring yourself that it's not forever. Yeah, if, if I could just add on, right, one of the things that um, I do think, you know, having been in this job now uh, about a year, I do think that some people think when you join the army, you, you like give up being a person, you know, that like somehow we're asking you not to be a regular person. I mean, once you're through training and you get out to your unit, it's just like normal life. It's like a job. Yes, there are some things that we get asked to do that are a little slightly different. You know, we have to go places, but I mean, most of us look at that as an adventure. Uh, but I mean, you know, I'm a huge sports fan. I watch, you know, sports at night. I, I you know, go out with friends, I play golf. You know, all of us do those things. And I just... You know, the uniform is our outward appearance while we're at work. And I mean, we're always soldiers, but trust me, we, we all do have normal lives that are outside of that. And, you know, my mom still calls me every day and, you know, 
Uh, I live up, you know, I'm from Bucks County. I live in Bucks County. And so, you know, we have normal lives and I just, you can be a soldier and do every other thing you think uh, that you want to do in life. Um, you know, and really I think being a soldier helps you do those other things. So uh, that's a good question. Um, all right, Mike, it's 1130. So I think what we'll do is we'll close this out. Um, and I know that whatever questions we got in the chat, we're going to, we're going to take, and we will get the answers to you via, you know, email text somehow through the recruiter. Uh, but I asked that all the future soldiers and the uh, potential applicants, you know, keep talking to your recruiter. Uh, and so I'll just close this out, you know, to, to, uh, Mrs. Webster, uh, Specialist Rano, PFC Arias and Cadet Lassen. I just, I can't tell you how much we appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. And I mean, every single person in the army has a story. And, you know, I think that's just the best part about being in the army is that we all come together and we all stand in the same formation. However, we all are different, but we're all pulling the same direction. Uh, and so I am just proud to hear all these stories. Uh, and I just hope that any future soldier or applicant uh, just gives us a chance, just give us a chance to tell the army message so that we can offer those opportunities and benefits uh, to you. So again, thanks to everyone for listening. Um, and, uh, you know, I just hope everyone has a great day. So thanks and be safe. Thank you, sir.